All right, with great data comes even greater access latency. Welcome to the Presto Community Broadcast, where we transform your latency woes into fast insights. I'm your host, Brian Olson. And we are again on another talk today together, Brian, and I'm Manfred Moser. Awesome. Yeah. So Presto Community Broadcast is a show where we cover events, happenings in the open source Presto community. And then we cool show off a little cool stuff about Presto. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's been uh, quite an eventful week. Uh, we got a new release out uh, since the last time we've been on the show. A couple yeah, things about that. yet again, seems to be like one after the other coming out. 347 this time, a whole bunch of cool things again. Yeah, I haven't seen, you know, it's interesting. I was like waiting for there to be another show where we have like two releases in one, but we haven't. <laughs> I feel like the cadence is like occasionally like, you know, it wraps around within the same time. Uh, but uh, but yeah, we, we definitely uh, uh, have a lot of uh, uh, releases going out. It's just that uh, they are at about two weeks, maybe sometimes a week and a half. And so eventually, occasionally we'll get those where we have like an episode where it has two releases uh, pulled in. And if you're not from around here or haven't been here before, we do these uh, broadcasts every two weeks uh, on this uh, um, uh, Twitch channel. So a um, couple episodes we have coming up. So we're... we're structuring this in kind of a way where we're building up to this concept for Presto called dynamic filtering. So we have a couple shows that, uh, that, you know, last week we did, or last two, two weeks ago, we, we covered, uh, hive partitioning and kind of how Presto leverages Hive to uh, do these partitions. Uh, this show we're we're covering query planning, um, and then uh, next show we're, we're gonna have a guest actually, uh, uh, Martin Traverso, which is uh, one of the uh, co-creators of Presto. So he'll be joining us to talk a little bit about the cost based optimizer. It's uh, kind of a sweet spot for him. And so uh, then shortly after that, uh, the next uh, topic will be distributed hash join, probably. Some Sometime around the you know 2021 part of the year, uh, we'll be covering that, and then finally, after we've covered all these different topics, we're going to end up getting into dynamic filtering finally. And and it's it's one of those things that you know if you're from the Presto community already, or you've been a developer on Presto for a while, this is something that you know has been around for for about a, a little bit, like two years now, you think. But uh, but for those that are kind of just getting into uh, Presto, this is like you know something that has uh, more recently been uh, acclimated into the ecosystem, and it's uh, it's just a very useful way of of performing these kind of uh, d distributed joins, and so um, and it just cuts off a lot of extra processing and a lot of extra work that doesn't need to be done. So we thought it was a really cool thing to build our way up to, and gave us like smaller, more fundamental topics to build on our way up there. So. So that's where we're at now. We're talking query planning today, but uh, uh, we'll get to that after we do uh, uh, news and other things. But first, uh, we're going to actually do the um, the sponsor announcement a little differently than normal. I usually play kind of my recording that's a, a pre-recorded pitch. But So you uh, got something new today, Brian? What's the cool thing? Tell me. So we're actually uh, Starburst, uh, the company that Manfred and I both work for. Uh, we're hosting the very first industry uh, conference, and uh, it's called Data Nova, uh, kind of fitting in with this uh, galactic, uh, you know, space type theme that we have going on. So um, uh, the uh, the tagline is Data Nova, analyze the unknown. So um, let me, uh, oh, psh, I didn't even, I'm sitting here looking at this and I didn't even realize that nobody else could see this. <laughs> so no, that's okay. We can see it now. Yes. <laughs> so, so Data Nova, uh, if you go to basically starburstdata.com forward slash Data Nova, um, you can uh, you can check this out. It's uh, basically all that you need to know about the event. It's it's for people who are kind of interested in data. <laughs> so this could apply to pretty much any business. Uh, and this good this is uh, not only going to be applying to you know data engineers and our, our typical you know run of the gambit of data scientist, data engineer, but we also are, are uh, having a a, def, a separate track that are going to be kind of geared towards like uh, data leaders. So pe people who are kind of at the executive level making decisions. And, and trying to help them understand a little bit more about Presto and what it can do for their business and their and their architecture. So so that's the that's really the 
the uh, goal of this this conference is to just bring that awareness and uh, and so uh, we have a lot of really cool speakers so as we said uh, you know we have data leaders data engineers data architects and data scientists and analysts so those are all all the people that are you know very going to be interested and welcome to to come to uh, data Nova um, the coolest thing I think uh, about this and this is just like my own little nerdy uh, excitement that uh, we have Bill Nye he is our celebrity guest that will be talking about uh, avoiding the end of the world so uh, so that's going to be an interesting topic everybody who, who attends is going to be seeing his his uh, talk and so that's one's going to be uh, you know in the in the sense I think, of I think I have to interject for a second there because um, having a European background, uh, Bill Nye is not a household name, actually. So, and, and some of the people in our audience might not know who Bill oh. Nye is either. So, it's Bill Nye, the science guy. For those that don't know, is a very, very famous scientist and um, a show. Uh, like he has around a lot of educational shows and stuff on TV, and everyone here in the US growing up knows him from various shows. He's a very entertaining character, and. He obviously, with his science back, has a very unique view and take on what data is all about and um, data Nova being all about big data processing and stuff. That's a very good fit. So, um, yeah, he also has like this. Uh, if you are interested in Bill Nye in general, like he has this uh, show called Bill Nye Saves the World. If you use Netflix, uh, so uh, it's basically going into trying to talk about things that are scientifically uh, proven, but then, you know, in the pop culture and, and everything like that kind of get confused. And so he's like, you know, one, one of the topics he talks on one of these shows is like anti, you know, kind of debunking the vaccine myths and things like that. So yeah, it's all about evidence, right? Like, yeah, evidence-based science that's trying to back up like, you know, claims that, uh, you know, that end up getting kind of fuzzied in, in pop culture and, uh, and just kind of news and media and stuff. So, so he, he addresses a lot of that from a very scientific standpoint. So he just does a lot of cool things for the science community in general. So we're really glad to have him. Um, so yeah, sorry, I, I didn't mean to assume that, you know, everybody just knows Bill Nye. I know, but... I just thought I'd throw it in. It's also interesting <laughs> too, like, you know, like this leads for people to check out really cool material from him. And um, the whole larger data aspect, I think is very important. Like we'll have a whole bunch of other sponsors and partners joining us to talk about, you know, the whole analytical space and like choosing different data sources. But tell us a bit more about what presenters or and like topics already are lined up. Yeah, so we we have, you know, anybody from our, our marketing chief marketing officer, Jess, uh, she and you're we're going to see a little bit of a talk from her uh, as uh, one of the six reasons you need to attend Data Nova uh, videos that she's made. They're freaking hilarious. Um, yeah. But uh, basically, she she is uh, going to be giving a talk. I, I can pull up the agenda now to actually uh, give a bit of a, a glance at what uh, some of these are. So um, Justin Borgman, our CEO, is going to be talking about X Analytics, um, and uh, Matt Fuller uh, is going to be talking about uh, single point of access. And then uh, we're also having these, you know, Oxford debates um, of like kind of this is this one's more the leadership side. So it's kind of looking at you know these buzzwords and kind of like uh, trying to get the trend. You know, buzzwords actually attached to real architecture at some point, and so. You know, where are the trends actually going in terms of like, are people going to continue just like primarily focusing on warehouses? Are we going to be, you know, mostly data lakes where a lot of people in the, moving to the cloud are today? Or is this kind of new lake house, which is a bit hybrid, hy you know, th here's here's another buzzword for you, hybrid cloud. <laughs> uh, exactly. And so, uh, you know, is that kind of uh, where, where we're going to be at? And so we have people talking about that. Um, and so uh, a lot of these ones, you know, if, if most people I think that listen to this are going to, uh, this podcast and, and watch the show, they're going to be probably more interested in the, in the technical side, which we're it's not being featured here yet because I'm still crafting it. Um, but we do have uh, some folks from Comcast who are going to be talking about their Presto to Presto connector. So they actually like wrote a, a, a connector and they made what they call uh, is a query fabric uh, is what is called internally at uh, Comcast. And so they basically have two separate Presto instances that uh, they can uh, basically unite into uh, one uh, single location for, you know, their data scientists or their clients. They don't have to go to two different Presto locations. Oh, you know? don't need to know. That's cool. Exactly. So it all, all gets hidden behind that. So they'll, they'll talk about that, a bit of their architecture. We also have uh, a couple people that are focused in on like these, you know, 
getting into this uh, a little more difficult concept of abstraction. How do you abstract all these catalogs and things like that? And so, uh, so a lot of cool things that I've heard that uh, we're, we're still working on exactly when the agenda is. And the other thing that we're, we're also going to be doing is, um, you know, we're going to be doing these hands-on trainings uh, that we're, we're putting together. So if you've never touched Presto or specifically Starburst Presto, uh, these are, are some things that you'd like to, you know, we'd like to get you uh, on. There's a couple things I can't announce yet, unfortunately. Uh, kind of, you know, hush hush at this point. But uh, uh, hopefully, in, in, when we talk about this in future episodes, I get to reveal a couple more things about the technical track a, as well. But it's going to be really fun. And uh, uh, last bit of, of uh, sponsorship uh, thing I wanted to show is this one minute clip of uh, of um, uh, Jess. Hi, I'm Jess, and you're watching a six part series on why you should attend Data Nova. So we can't have this event without talking about cloud migration, but we wanted to do it a little differently by sharing real challenges. Maybe you went a little too fast and furious. Maybe your migration looks more like this. Girl, what? Girl, knees? Oh, Frank's got that. Maybe you thought you would save a lot of money, but you forgot to tune your queries and they ran overnight and your cloud provider is looking like this. <laughs> we'll talk about all of these things and you'll walk away with lessons learned so you can avoid making those same mistakes. Register now. And with that, I think one very important aspect is register now and registration is free and it's a two day event in early February, right? Yeah, February 9th and February 10th, uh, 2021. That's a good point. I should have said the date. Another cultural reference there in that video, I just realized, uh, does, does everybody in Europe know about uh, Fast and Furious video series? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I think anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Bill Nye's not known, then what is? It's <laughs> Okay. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's well, our... Well, that's, it's like some of those things, right? Like when I moved to Australia and had like... There was all the Wiggles stuff, and I didn't know about it until I had kids here in Canada, right? And in Austria, nobody ever heard about the Wiggles or whatever. Right? Like, so it's things that are like... Also, if you don't have kids. <laughs> exactly. So, cool. Well, uh, so that was, uh, you know, a little bit of a fun replacement. Uh, we're probably going to be doing those in, in place of our, our typical recordings uh, the next couple episodes, just uh, until about February time frame. So look forward to a couple of those. Uh, and, and that I think it's a lot more fun than just playing the pre-recorded stuff. But uh, now that we're done with the sponsor notes, uh, let's dive into a little bit of uh, Release 347. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, if you're interested to speak at Data Nova, feel free to reach out to us. Yeah, for sure. So 347, uh, another release uh, ran across the finish line. A bit of a shorter one, but in terms of changes. But um, if you look at the release notes, uh, Martin announced like three main features that he pointed out. And that is, again, um, support for new SQL statements, in this case for the accept all and intersect all statements. Yeah. Um, and then new syntax for chainer, changing the owner of a view slash table. That's in the Hive connector mostly. Uh, if you can scroll down to the oh, Hive yeah. connector, you actually oh, see here there's we go. a bunch of Hive um, things yet again, right? Like with the Hive connector being such a crucial hmm. kind of component, accessing all the data sources, there's always stuff going on there. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's those. Uh, and then again, a couple of performance improvements. Again, some interesting ones actually. Um, the ones things that I uh, I found one function that's really cool. I think this contains uh, sequence section is very function is very cool. If you look at the third line there, uh, a sequence basically ah, in an array sequence. you can look for an uh, like for a small array in a larger array, which is kind of a handy little function. Oh, nice. To have. So that's kind of cool. If you're working with arrays, then that can come in handy and, you know, arrays does quite a lot. So it's, it's not just like contains where you're looking for just one element. One, and, and Yeah, no, entire... like you're looking for a sequence of them, so, which is pretty cool. That's like, you know, if you would want to do that with SQL yourself, you'd be like scratching your head quite a bit. It'd be pretty painful or oh, yeah. slash impossible. So having this kind of stuff implemented like as a function is really useful. Oh, man, and that's that's such a common use case when you th think of anything algorithmic. Like, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right? So it's, it, that's really handy to have. And um, so I saw cool. a cool part that I wanted to uh, to, to check out. The, I saw the CLI, the CLI change because that, that doesn't come up too often. Where is it? There we go. 
Uh, so the shell redirection, um, I mean, I, I took a dive into, this is uh, uh, PR5881, uh, and uh, this is basically like, if you want to push some sort of like query as as like, let's say, you know, you echo and then you pipe it into Presto, you can now do that. So <laughs> yeah. uh, in a couple of ways, I'm not sure how many ways you can, you know, you could think of to do this, but this is covering like you echo out some, some you know, uh, uh, query or something like that and then you pipe that into the presto executable uh, jar which for those that aren't familiar like the cli is just like this this uh, uh J- java archive file which is just a jar that you run and then it runs almost like an, any other executable on your machine it does right like all it needs is java and the cool thing is also and that's kind of interesting with that is um the CLI, on the one hand, you can use it interactively, obviously, and it has command completion and all sorts of really useful features. But what it also has is formatting. So you can run a SQL statement into it, and then the output can be formatted in different formats. Yep. So you can s- select it to be like text or tab completed, like tab similar or like CSV or JSON and so on. And this allows you to get that generated on the fly. Yeah. And what's a common use case for the CLI is actually like having a cron statement or some sort of like regularly run thing into Presto executed via the CLI. And then now you can actually sort of like you could version control basically the statement that's run yeah. and the output can then be captured and sent wherever. So it's pretty cool for automation and stuff. So it's really nice. Oh yeah, that's exactly what I, the, the, the use case I was thinking. Cause so I, I mentioned for those that like aren't able to, to view this that are on the podcast, you know, I mentioned the echo one, but then they also have a, a version that pulls it from a SQL file. So you could have mm-hmm. you know file.sql and then, you know, you just do the little less than symbol that's like kind of, you know, uh, catting it or kind of moving it in there uh, to a, uh, kind of streaming it in there <laughs> and so uh, that basically uh, streams it directly into the Presto CLI executable um, so uh, really really cool stuff that uh, I always like seeing ones that I you don't typically see which is like any CLI change uh, yeah I have some more of those for you by the way but uh, since you mentioned the CLI I have to tell you something um, uh, we have to fess up on something um, in order to get this working we had to upgrade a library to that, that works with parameter parsing and output uh, processing and stuff like that hmm. and there was a bit of a mess up so when you run a CLI like a query in the CLI it shows this progress dynamically normally within the UI yeah, yeah. like within the well it's not a UI within the CLI, CLI yeah. in the output that's busted at the moment <laughs> got it but, but I mean, we already have a fix for 348. So in the 348 release, that's that's here. that's not like breaking though. Anyways, that's no, just kind of a break nice anything. It's just a progress display kind of thing on yeah. the fly, right? So but it's I not like, a problem. Yeah, but it's still like I mean, most of the time these things get ran, and you're like, you're not even viewing this stuff half the time, anyways. And yeah, exactly. You know. For for that usage, it has no impact. Very so cool. that's definitely a, definitely a good one. Um, right underneath, there's another change that I thought is important and interesting: the Docker image change, and that yeah. is. It was updated to CentOS 8. So you can, like, considering that um, our main Docker image from PrestoSQL now uses CentOS 8, you can basically consider it a fully supported um, operating system at this day. It's just like uh, Azul Zulu, the open JDK distribution is kind of like the preferred uh, and most proven JDK Java version. This is pretty much the most used operating system i remember my last there. company i was actually like we were still migrating stuff from like centos uh, six to seven and so i only know like i have eight was like a such a long far far way away you know i feel like just any any big enterprise company that's big enough but not like one of the major ones you're always kind of in these like slower moving things yeah. over phase and so i uh i i'm just you know, I, I always want to uh, stress like it's it's really nice to when when the main uh, uh, kind of software that you're using, especially if you're typically sort using of it, in, yeah. yes, is sort of up to date. And so uh, at least you're working in some environments where you're like getting to get exposure to these newer operating systems and kind of the features that they bring, and then that gives you even more evidence to say, hey. Why, why haven't the ops guys on our team, you know, been focusing on CentOS 8? It has this, this, and this. So I actually, at this point, I actually have zero clue uh, what advantages CentOS 8 brings, but I'm sure it's like performance at the very least and security. Yeah. Well, like 
Oh, the kernel and lots and lots of packages will be updated, right? So it's going to sure. be massive, massive changes. So that's yeah. good. So awesome. I thought that's pretty interesting and just to, to know. And then one last one that's related to what we are building up to this complex, uh, complex thing of dynamic filtering. Oh, I know you're going. I know you're going uh, with this. <laughs> it's actually implemented in the CUDA connector. So. Uh, if someone wants to play around with that and see what it looks like in action, the CUDA connector has that now. And of course, the Hive connector already has it. So, And we also have Iceberg has some limited fun support for dynamic filtering, or is it totally supported in Iceberg? Uh, uh, I think that came in the last release. Yeah, Something I saw some. Iceberg. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it must be pretty close or already there. Iceberg has gotten quite a bit of attention, that's for sure. So. Yeah, for sure. I'm curious to see, like, how, as this is starting to spread like wildfire now, like, yeah, once, yeah. once it started in dynamic filtering, was starting in, you know, just a hive thing, but now it's becoming like more uh, kind of ubiquitous throughout all of the Presto ecosphere. So, that's right. very cool. All right. Anything else you yes. wanted for the. the no, release? I think that's good. Cool. Well, with it's, that, it's yet another cool release, I think. Why don't we head on over to uh, the concept of the week? Yeah, concept of the week. Um, exciting. Um, Brian has a whole bunch of cool uh, <laughs> demos going on. <laughs> but before we go into the demos, I have to explain a few things. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what happens sort of uh, when a query is submitted and how Presto decides what it is actually going to do. Uh, and that is so, first of all, Basically, we're talking about query planning, which basically is the process of uh, Presto figuring out after it received the SQL statement via the like via some tool like the CLI or some application like uh, you know Superset or DBVO or whatever via the JVC connection. So it gets a SQL statement. It's just a string, right? So Presto has to then go, okay, what am I going to do with this? So it goes through sort of multiple phases until it actually starts running the thing. The first part is the what's, we call, what's called parser analyzer. So it does a syntax check, so to speak, and parses the whole SQL statement into an abstract, abstract syntax tree. So it does checks like, well, is this keyword actually typed correctly? Like, is it yeah. select or is the C and T mixed up or something like that? All those kind of things. It then also figures out uh, that the tables, columns, and all that kind of stuff, like catalogs and schemas, that those even exist. Um, and then once it sort of has a minimum knowledge about that, it goes into planning. Now, when it goes to planning is the process where it goes, well, now that I know sort of what to do, how, what, what the user requests, right? Like an SQL statement basically says, hey, you give me that data. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really care how like your statement when you program the SQL statement, you're not telling Presto what to do or your database. So you just tell it, give me the data. So that tool, in our case Presto, has to figure out how to get this data. And that's what the planner is doing. Yeah. So it's like a declarative do, is a, the, I don't remember if you just said the term or not, but it's declarative versus imperative styles. Right? Yeah, it's not telling you do this step and then that step. Actually, if you think about that, that would be super complicated to do in many sequences. So it's yeah. super nice not to have to worry about that. Yeah. Basically, um, declarative is just saying, you know, don't worry about the implementation details. We got you covered. Like, that's the whole point of, of this database management systems and, like, having these query language be the abstraction. You're just declaring right. what you kind of, what, what your want, your intention is. And then it's up to, you know, us as the engine, the query engine, to, to do it versus, you know, imperative is saying, hey, you got to do it all, <laughs> you know, exactly. figure it out. So once it has that statement parsed and knows, as a next step, it has to go well. So you're talking about these catalogs and schemas and columns. Let's see if they even exist. So it has to go to the underlying catalogs, schemas, and tables and columns, get from the information schema or whatever implements that metadata. Could be the Hive meta store or just the information schema in a relational database or whatever. To say, well, actually, yeah, you're right. Those tables exist and those columns exist. So that's good. Then it has to go, well, those data types are also compatible. I can work with those. And then it does more. It creates what's called the logical plan, where it actually figures out, well, is this even possible? Like, say you have a where statement where you're comparing uh, some column with a specific value. Well, that needs to make sense, right? You can't go compare a date with, I don't know, like a, a float number or something like yeah. that, right? Like, this doesn't make sense, right? So those kind of things all have to be verified before you can go and actually make a plan about how to actually, like, 
do the processing. So all of that is done and is based on the metadata about sort of how the data is structured. And um, that is then used to create what's called the logical plan. So we'll see that later. And then that logical plan can potentially be inefficient, right? <laughs> like, hmm. like you have a table with a hundred million records and you're like, you want to top whatever or something with a, some wear condition, well, you don't need to load the whole table. So maybe you should like push down something and whatever, right? So you want to eliminate redundant conditions, figure out the best order of operations on joins, mm -hmm. make sure you filter early, all those kind of optimizations, they all fall in place. And then potentially you can also do cost-based optimizations where you uh, use the metadata from the system that has things like, well, what values are, like what's the null distribution and those kind of things for specific tables. And you basically end up with a plan mm -hmm. to run that query. Yeah. Uh, and that's good, but it's not the last step because remember Presto is a distributed system. So yep. it can take advantage of the fact that there is many workers that can run uh, and talk to the underlying data source in parallel. So if you have say a Hive data store and you have storage in distributed across a couple, like a whole cluster of, uh, of HDFS directory structures and whatever, then different workers could go and talk to different storages uh, and get all that stuff in parallel. So that's the kind of stuff uh, Preston needs to think about when it creates and morphs that logical plan into what's called the distributed plan. So it breaks it up, figures out what to do in parallel, which data to get, and then also once it got the data, where to best process any aggregations, rather than letting the underlying system do it, it can uh, do it itself in memory in another worker and so on. So that's the distributed plan. Yeah. So that's kind of what's happening. And as a user, this is kind of completely hidden for you and you don't really need to care about it until you need to care about it. Yep. <laughs> because, <laughs> Because like ideally this is all like, yay, it works, it's super fast and everything. But in practice, that's not always the case. So um, with if you're dealing with, you know, millions and millions of records, there is just some things you sometimes want to understand what's going on. And there's various ways you can do that. And that's what uh, Brian is going to show us a lot more today. Mm -hmm. um, there's the explain statement and you can lose the web UI. And... That's what Brian is going to show us. And um, if you're interested in more of that, of course, make sure you get the book Press to the Definitive Guide for free from Starburst. There's a whole chapter about this architectural stuff. And let's see what Brian's got to show. Awesome. Yeah, I wanted to, before we jump right into the PR of the week and, and, uh, and do all this stuff, I wanted to make a, a bit of a nerdy analogy for, for if you're a programmer, you, you'll, you'll kind of, this will fall into your line of thinking. Uh, so if you're like a programmer coming in the, just the database world, if you're not a programmer, you can ignore this part and just skip ahead. <laughs> so, um, but I always think of like, so the parser is kind of like the syntax check before I'm going to compile my code. Then, you know, the compilation step is kind of the lot, like getting to the logical phase. So, you know, you compile your code, but you haven't actually run it yet. And then the distributed query plan would be something on the lines of like, you know, the physical, like your, where you actually end up running that, that compiled code. Uh, that's all it's right. A, oh, I have, I have another one for you. Oh no. <laughs> that's a good analogy. I can get even geeky on that. Okay, Look at do that. It, do it. So the, when, uh, when the compiled code then runs in a Java virtual machine, mm -hmm. it can do optimizations on the fly of the algorithms based on how it runs in the past. So it can cut like cut off loops and whatever based on the data, right? The, the Java virtual machine can do that kind of stuff. Oh, and yeah. it's kind of ex like, it's basically based on the data flow through the algorithm while it runs. Yeah. And that's kind of how the cost-based optimizer is adapting to the data. It's we can't talk too much about the cost-based optimizer. That's next week. <laughs> <laughs> but All yeah, right. I, I'm going to be cutting it off now. Yeah, <laughs> Wait, that's uh, you're you're stealing Martin's thunder before he's even on. <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah, that's that's uh, exactly the kind of line of thinking. Is like so sometimes when I you know before I was really more into the database side of things, I remember like the logical versus distributed or like you know sometimes they just call it physical query plan. Uh, it's it's a lot of like 
difficulty in understanding why, you know, why there's those two different things. So that was kind of an analogy that, that I kind of eventually ran, ran into that. I was like, it kind of helped me think about it like that. Like, Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, but- it's like, uh, you know, syntax check when, when you see those squiggly red lines underneath your, in your ID and you're pissed off. And then it goes, uh, you know, the next thing will go to, uh, a logically working functioning thing, but it may not be exactly how it's going to run when the rubber meets the road and you're actually running this program. So anyways, uh, that may have been totally lost on a few, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, that's okay. You know, it's like, hang on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that with that, let's go on to the PR of the week so that we don't waste anybody's anybody else's time. So uh, this week's PR of the week is uh, was actually one from still a, a while ago. We've we've been kind of reaching back because you know more recently there there haven't been as many uh, at least easy to understand uh, conceptually understandable uh, pull requests when it comes to trying to relate it to the concepts of the week that we're trying to cover. Uh, for this. So I just, I'm reaching back uh, at a couple of these older ones. And this one was done by uh, Martine, who will be joining us next week. And, um, you know, this, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, what's, what's the the outcome, but you know, the, the changes were, were pretty involved and, and, and mainly in so, so much in that this was mostly like a couple changes to the actual code, but you really wanted to test to make sure that nothing was wrong. So if you look at these, I think most of the of the code that's changed here is, is primarily tests uh, being run. There's the there's the optimizer code here that, that actually gets set up uh, and then the rewriter. Uh, but then there's a lot of uh, of tests that are, are being you know updated here uh, because this ends up touching a lot of uh, areas in the uh, in the code that we end up using. So uh, so what this this uh, actually is doing is uh, when you're doing kind of these these predicates. So uh, predicates is is just a word for kind of saying like the uh, the uh, filter, or you know, there's another word for predicate. Or you know, when you say basically when you say uh, select all or select star from some table and then you say where and then you start kind of uh, filling out these filter statements so you know where customer id is greater than this or where yeah, condi- their conditions right? conditions like- yeah that's that's the other way <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking filter i'm thinking predicate but yeah conditions is yet another word so you know conditions as to th- basically these are, are rules for thing you know i want i don't want any row being returned unless they meet this criteria um so when you're filling these out they can they can typically be uh you know if you're writing a small query it's pretty easy to keep track but let's say you start writing these giant queries that typically end up you know growing in production over time um so uh or maybe you're not even writing the queries but it's getting generated in some way uh what can happen yeah, especially like bi tools and stuff like that yep. they have some some standard way of creating queries and the queries they create sometimes you don't want to look at them oh yeah it can be it can be duplicate hell <laughs> and so you know you could have something where it just says like customer key greater than 100 and then and this is when it's going to be one of the ones we'll show you here but you know customer key greater than 100 and then customer key greater than 50 well we're already restricting it to anything greater than 100 so the greater than 51 doesn't make any sense so with this is doing is you're, you're trying to remove these duplication uh, bits here, or if you're, let's say you're doing, you know, A equals one, uh, one equals A is also yet another equivalent statement that, that you, we're trying to remove here. And this can be in a and or or situation. And so, uh, so when it comes to building the logical uh, part of this query, you want to remove these duplicates because that just ends up creating extra work. Uh, it can actually, uh, you know, maybe, maybe in some ways just confuse when, when, uh, like uh, things are being basically in terms of how the, the code is actually going to end up like being executed when we're talking about, you know, the, having a correct logical plan ends up, you know, exponentially influencing how well your physically dis- distributed plan runs, because maybe you have some constraint in there where the physical plan that ends up getting generated uh, is actually suboptimal because you have this these extra criteria in there. So it's very important that on these stages, you have the, a, a very good logical plan set up. And so uh, anybody that's kind of confused on what any of this means, I'm hoping we're going to use this this demo today as kind of a, a bit of a visual. So uh, first, let me introduce this this tool. Uh, this is a, a very like common open source tool called uh, GraphViz. Um, I, I don't know if it's called Viz or GraphViz. There's everybody can call it something different, but I think GraphViz is the tr- is the canonical yeah, so, but... word for the tool. Um, so uh, so this is basically just a standard of uh, uh, it. Basically, has this 
this standard to, to easily create uh, syntax to define a visual graph. Um, for those of you on the podcast, do check out the show notes. Uh, unfortunately, this, this part is going to be uh, heavily visual, so you can kind of uh, maybe even skip ahead uh, and then just check out the show notes. I'm going to have examples of, of what we run through today or check out the video afterwards. Um, so so this, this visual is basically going to show us a graph of what these uh, first, what the uh, uh, abstract syntax tree, which is called, uh, it's called the AST, uh, you, you maybe heard that a couple times. So that's going to be the first uh, line. So let's let's actually start there. We don't have any a formal tool yet in in Presto to actually generate an abstract syntax tree. I'm actually working around with a little bit of test code uh, locally, and I, I hope to kind of integrate this uh, to Presto at some point uh, so that we can generate these uh, these graphics things. So I'm going to generate. Uh, let me just try to generate this. Yeah, test PCB query. Um, and so it basically goes through uh, this query here. This sele- uh, the query is select all from, uh, and then in parentheses values one. So we just return a basically a single value of one, and then we cast that as a table T with a column called A, and then we check where A equals one, where one equals A, or where A equals one. So we have a you know three duplicates here basically, and we want to eventually see that those duplicates go away when we create the logical plan. But first, we we when we go put this through the parser, let me take this uh, let me take this syntax real fast, um, and and paste this into this uh, this graph tool here. So this actually gives us our abstract syntax tree. And now I am unfortunately in the way of this a little bit. Let me see if I can. Uh, That's okay. Ultimately, what you can see here is what Presto creates because the. Yeah. You're basically farming this into the query planner from Presto, and it's just like giving us all the class names yep. and stuff like that. So the root node starts at this, you know, query node. It goes into this query specification node, uh, and these are, these are all types of of, of uh, what the SQL parser internally uses. Uh, to to recognize different elements in the query in the SQL query, so it parses it parses this select statement. Oh, here we go. I can actually uh, uh, move these around. So it parses this select statement, select all from values one da 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 da, and it makes it into this. So we have a you know one node from this query specification that points to a select node, and that points to an all columns node. So that's telling Presto uh, when it comes in to read this tree, it's telling it, hey, we're going to be pulling all the columns from from this particular particular table. And so it, it pulls out this alias relation called T. Uh, that table has a subquery, which is just an, yet another query that has a values list. And that is just literally a value list of long literal one. So that's what that from value is here. And then you have all these, you know, this, this where clause, there's a logical binary expression that we point to. Uh, and then it basically has, you know, a, 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 a subtree of all of these different uh, A equals one, one equals A or A equals one. Um, at the, at the abstract syntax tree level, this is correct. This is, we don't want to, we're, we're not at a point yet where we're actually trying to logically compress, uh, these, these, you know, or make these into a canonical form where we have, okay, a equals one, one equals a, that's all the same thing. Merge it into one. That's not the, the goal of the parser. Actually, the goal of the parser is to simply just get this into a form that we can now start running these analysis things that, that Manfred was talking about where we say, Hey, uh, we're, we're, uh, referencing this table t and we're 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 basically trying to say a equals something is there any of the tables here uh does do any of the tables here have uh a value a uh and so we since we cast this um this isn't in the ast thing that i'm showing here but there is information in this as the actual ast that shows the columns of this relation and you can actually uh, look and find that there is is in fact an A uh, column there, and you would be able to actually say, okay, this identifier A must be talking about this A because there's no other A column in, in all of these relationships. So that's the only goal of the parser is to basically make sure that the syntax is correct. Um, and we haven't even gotten into the analyzer yet. That's going to be kind of an invisible step that I'm not going to show in any visual, but the analyzer can then come around and, and do these validations and say, hey, is A existing here? Yes, it does. Okay, cool. 
So, so that after the analysis phase, now we're ready to actually go into the logical, uh, uh, basically get, get the logical graph for this. And in this one, we actually, where am I here? Here we go. Uh, I'm going to go into D beaver. Now. Um, I have a little bit of setup, uh, 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 and basically set up commands that I ran before this. So I'll leave these in the show notes, but, uh, but you can, uh, reference that later, basically just copied over some orders table, uh, from, from the, um, from our TPCH connector. Uh, so going straight into this explain demo, let's go ahead and actually run, uh, uh get a logical, um, query. So we're going to say explain that select all from values one query uh, that we just said where a equals one, one equals a and a equals one. And we want to get the logical, we want to get the logical representation of this query. And we, you know, at, we're asking it to format that explain into a graph viz. So this is actually something that's inside of, of, uh, of um, Presto. And let me just copy that now. And we can actually now visualize this. So that's something that anyone can run themselves, right? Basically, yep. because it's part of the normal explain statement for Presto. There's the syntax that allows you to specify the format and the type of plan to create. Exactly. This is all, all part of just, this is run against the Presto cluster just now. So the syntax tree one, that one is, is yet to come. Uh, I'll hopefully get around to that at some point in the next couple of months. But then uh, the, <laughs> when I have all this time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Then, yeah. That's what I was just <laughs> laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but then I, uh, but yeah, eventually, uh, you know, so for now we just have the logical and distributed query and you can just find that type logical to say, I just want to see what the logical query looks like. And so I, I plop that into this graph viz, um, and, uh, this graph viz uh, field thing. And by the way, for those on the podcast that are still listening, it's, uh, V I Z dash J A S dot com. Uh, we, we use, I, I use this one a lot just to kind of, you can basically copy and paste a, a graph definition and just play, paste it right into your uh, your field here. So as we see, we have another tree here. Um, we see this box around it that says single, um, but then we see these different uh, uh, dependencies going on here. So we moved from, you know, we have this output A uh, and we have filters and we only see a single filter here. Um, so this is where, uh, and then we, you see this exchange node, uh, and, and then it pulls from this values va uh, value, which is just the, um, it's actually pulling from that, um, that, it, you know, that's the source essentially of our data is this values list of, of literally one. <laughs> and so, um, so then that gets pushed back into the exchange node. It says, okay, let me read this, this one value and then pass it up. And then we have a filter that says is a equal to one. Uh, and then we output that value at that point. Um, so let me go back and actually show you if we didn't have equivalent statements. So hang there. on, just, just to clarify. So the crucial difference that we notice now is that in the first statement where it was just the abstract syntax tree, there were three comparison, like there were three of those logical operators. Yeah. And thanks to that pull request, now in the logical plan, there is only one yeah, because so it understood that A is one and one is A is the same. And if you have the same thing twice, that's also the same. So let's get it into one. Yeah. Let me show in this next example, I'm going to show you another logical uh, example where the, they're not the same. So this is what, if you were to say A equals one, and I think in this case, it's A equals two, one equals A and or A equals three, that's the new query. And now you actually see all three of these. So if they're actually logically different, the log, you know, we, we're not going to optimize those away because those are distinctly different statements and they don't need to be optimized in any way. They are, we, you know, maybe it would be more interesting to say, you know, greater than one or less than equal to three, greater than or equal to uh, zero or something like that. But then, uh, so that you define a range that there's only two, but I mean, this still works. You can say one or two or three. Um, and so, so that would be the, the equivalent, um, uh, state statement right here. And so, uh, so that's where, when we have it, where it's logically equivalent, like we saw in the previous one, that's where, you know, that, that this, uh, pull request comes into place is those end up getting compressed into a single, uh, one. And so we're going to show a couple more examples, but first let's go into, oh, actually, no, I go straight into the distributed. Why don't we, yeah, the distributed, uh, actually the distributed plan for this ends up looking pretty much the same because 
when you think about the distributed plan for, for this, we're not actually pulling this data from a source. We're actually saying from a, a list of values that we're defining. So this actually runs on a single, uh, you know, the, the one single worker. Um, and in this case, my, my Presto setup is literally just a coordinator that is its own worker. So when you see this single box around here, uh, it's actually literally running on a single location. And so if we, why don't I just, just for kicks, why don't we just go ahead and just change that to distributed? Um, I can just change it here, actually. Distributed, distributed. And then I can basically show you that that's going to end up, oh, here. Uh, doing the same. Yeah, I need to actually run <laughs> and then copy this. There we go. Yeah, let's actually just show the distributed one. The only thing that's changed here really is that this name is distributed plan, but this looks almost like identical to to the logical plan. And that's yeah. because we're literally running this on the same node. <laughs> so yeah. so this there's nothing to distribute across and it's not interesting. So uh, I didn't want to just totally skip that and leave that in somebody's mind. So let's go on to a query that actually sources from data. And this is where, what I ran before. I actually have this orders table that I've created in MinIO. And we're gonna run a distributed query and we're gonna uh, basically duplicate a whole bunch of things here. So we're gonna say from orders uh, where uh, customer key is greater than 100, uh, where customer key is greater than 50 and customer key is greater than 50 and customer key is greater than 50. <laughs> we could basically just like copy this a couple times and and see what, what actually ends up coming from that. So uh, let me yeah execute that against Presto and see what we get back. For the distributed so ultimately what we end up getting from that all those 50s that greater than 50 like those are meaningless and the 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 query uh the the planner knows this the planner basically took a look at those you know okay i have this this uh syntax that says customer query is greater than you know 100 and now i have this customer query greater than 50. well you know, I already have to get in something greater than a hundred and it, you know, so this, this one that goes between 50 to a hundred, like that's already something that can't be and the end result of this, of this query. So I'm just going to get rid of this statement and then it goes and find the next one and says, wait a second, yet again, I'm seeing this customer greater than 50. Yeah. Let's throw this one out too. <laughs> and so it just keeps doing that. So all of these pretty much just got hacked. And then we were left with this one customer key greater than 100. So that is, and, and yet again, uh, we see two nodes on this distributed query. So it's a little more interesting than the one we just showed you, but it's, it's basically just, you know, running this, this exchange on this, uh, on this one worker slash coordinator node. And then it just pulls this from MinIO. So, um, so that's, you know, again, not super interesting, but that's just to show you if you, if you were to actually just like, look at the logical version of this. Let's see. I don't think the lot and now I'm going to maybe I'm going to uh, do this live and then eat my words, but I don't believe the logical <laughs> is going to actually ready. Yeah, like I may I may be actually wrong on this. No, yeah, logical only talks on one node. Uh, yeah. because you're, 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 uh, you're just trying to get the information about what, what's going on. Not, you're not looking at how it's being split across into small sub sub chunks. So uh, one thing that's important about to know is also if you are running and getting a distributed, uh, query plan like that, it will depend on your cluster. Hmm. Like if you have 10 nodes versus 100, it will be different. Yep. Presto like, tries to basically max out your cluster and break things up where it makes sense. So uh, it will be dependent on your cluster in terms of the number of workers attached and also in terms of like memory allocation. Generally. Yeah, totally. And we'll, we'll, we're going to cover that in a lot more depth about like how it does that in the next uh, uh, weeks or next two weeks uh, episode where we talk about the cost space optimizer and, and dig into that. Um, and so the last piece of this demo, I want to kind of show uh, a join because that's, I think, where the most interesting stuff would come in, in terms of, uh, you know, actually show showcasing any type of distributed plan. So let's look at this distributed plan. This also has a couple of, you know, so we're, we're joining on uh, orders and customer here. And we're going to basically say, you know, on customer key equals, so on the orders table, customer key equals customer, uh, customer table, customer key. And then we have the other uh, uh, predicate. And this is uh, another thing you can do is you can add extra predicates in your join query. So this isn't in the where, 
this could actually sneak in somewhere. Let's say you're using a BI tool. It could actually generate a duplicate here where it's saying, you know, or on the customer key on the orders table greater than 50. And then the, on the customer key, uh, on the customer table, customer key greater than 50. And yet in this, you know, we, we already know what's going to happen to this one. But then, you know, the curiosity is, does it also detect on a different table that we should have, you know, we can we can filter out these. And so, you know, this is an interesting one to check out to say, how does it handle this duplicate? So when we run this, let's go ahead and run this and check out the node that comes from this. And this one's a little harder to see because unfortunately we have uh, these hashes in here. But what you wanna, you, what you basically wanna see is like, this is where everything gets gathered. So this is your, you know, kind of coordinator uh, node getting the information back. And this is the actual join here. And so what ends up happening is, this is just gonna end up being a scan. So this is on the orders table. If I go back to uh, the screen over here, this is, this is pulling from, uh, on the orders key and and you'll notice that we didn't actually end up filtering on that orders table we didn't filter by the customer key 50 there uh because it, it was able to realize that this is yet again even though it's on a different table this is still a duplicate because when we go down here to the customer table we're already you know going to basically be building based on customer key greater than five 100 so there's no point that we actually get greater than 50 because anything that gets returned here we want to just basically you know probe anything that that gets returned from this table and then we're going to hit it hit that limit whenever it's 10 you know where the the limit gets here there's an exchange of uh where's the limit limit 10. so once we actually get to that limit you know once we hit 10 then we're done with the query and like we don't have to stream any more uh things coming in from this probe side anymore so mm -hmm. so that's that's really the the power of coming up with the correct logical plan before you go distributing it you want to make sure that you're cutting out you know extra stuff like this and so that's really what what you end up getting with this uh this nice little um uh the where is it the um pull request oh, of 730 uh that that martine had so um so hopefully that was i i'm a visual person i people learn in totally different ways so if you learn just by actually running these things yourself all of these are um all these explain uh, uh, queries are going to be uh, something you can use. Uh, the only one you could you could basically uh, replace any of these MinIO ones. You can replace this with TPCH, and you can still get roughly like a query plan that gets generated. I only wanted to do this just to pull from a data source, uh, but this I think this will end up. Uh, you it know, should work with TPCH as well. Does it? Does 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 it? Because I'm not much actually here. Let's do that real fast, and I'll add this to the show notes if this works. <laughs> or if it doesn't work, it can be something that... At least in your scenario where you're only having one anyway, TPCH is a bit different because it generates the data on the fly and it's yeah. not sitting distributed across the system, but it should be similar. So let's, um, let me just pull this real... Oh, cool, yeah. So, and just, so just use TPCH. Don't even do all the extra mess that I did where I pulled it in there. I wanted, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted there to be some cool, like, you know, this this type of graph where we pull into different things. Uh, but but yeah, this is... this. Just do TPCH. I'll, I'll add that, uh, that variant to the show notes. And just if you need to run this by yourself, this will work on any Presto where you've set up the TPCH um uh the tpch uh, uh catalog and once you've done that then then you can run this and and start looking into you know ag analyzing how these distributed versus logical queries start to, to run um, but hopefully this helped out one other quick last mention i i want to make is uh you can also do a lot of this without having to do this graph is stuff um, if you're not interested in doing graphist stuff, uh, it's, it's a slightly different variant, but, uh, we can, you can actually look, um, these are all the explains. Let me actually run, uh, the actual query here. So if I run the actual query, uh, and I get the actual results back, so let's get the actual, these are the actual results. Um, then I see that query show up here. And you can, um, so, so this is, I took off the explain part and I just ran the query, uh, just to be clear about that. Um, where is it? I just ran this query right here without the explain. Uh, 
So, um, so if you go to the life plan of that, you can see a practically like almost the exact same uh, type of thing. And it pulls it on the stages. It's much more interactive. So I think most people end up doing going this way. Uh, I like showing the graph is version because it, it kind of, uh, you know, I think this is actually also graph is just a different rendering, but yeah, that's yeah. like, and for those of you that, that have looked, this is just accessing the web UI that comes on every coordinator exactly and logging in going into the finished queries and selecting the details about it in the live yeah. plan view so that's really so i like nice. graph is just for the simplicity aspect of it some people get a little overwhelmed by this looking for yeah, things in the live plan there. and and so i think graph is is just a very simple like this is just like this is just what it is and so you know all, all that it's a it's a tree of these nodes that that presto uh is is internally able to understand and and reason about uh much more easy in a programmatic fashion and that's that's why we put it in these tree formats there's so many you know existing algorithms that analyze these trees and that's just a very typical way that it's been approached in the database world since you know the 70s and <laughs> so <laughs> so that's why these trees are so popular and it's just a good to visualize these to get the understanding so with that uh i think that that's hopefully good enough for the uh the setup uh let's move on to the question of the week um and so this one uh so yeah all of these will be in the show notes uh here we go question of the week is how should i allocate uh memory properties and and uh this is kind of you know a, a very broad question. This isn't, there's not going to be a definitive answer. So, you know, spoiler alert, I, I, I'm the answer as is typical with a lot of these questions that get asked to us uh, are, it depends. Um, but I, I, there is some very clear guidance uh, that I think we can give to you in terms of like understanding, but I want to also back up for those that aren't as familiar with the memory system. I want to actually give a quick overview of like <laughs> the, an understanding of the memory system in general. So, uh, at least the main pieces. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, this is the memory of the Java virtual machine. Yes. Yes. So, so the, the first, the first very important aspect of like the memory setup is to configure the JVM max memory in your I hit that JVM as well. config in Presto. Okay, cool. Yeah, I had that just a little bit down in the bottom. So, so we start out with uh, user memory. Um, in general, these are things that, like, when you're when you're running these declarative queries, are th they're things that you can more or less reason about. Okay, what is the size of the input data that we're going to be scanning over? You know, is it? And if we if we look back at these plans, you know, that would be like, you know, basically finding out. Okay, there's approximately one thousand five hundred rows. Okay, so. I have 1,500 rows, so that's that's something that you can you know that's going to be user memory, um, you know hash tables and execution how how basically like the the data is being kind of moved back and forth between joins things like that uh, and then sorting uh, you know how long basically when you sort something you need to have the entire list of what you're sorting uh, basically in memory at that time so that's all done by user memory um, these are controlled uh, by these query max memory per node and query max memory uh, without the per node at the end. Um, so uh, I like to think of, I, I have this little visual down here that I liked to, to reference whenever we were thinking about this. So this would be, you the, the block would be your JVM heap on worker one, worker two, and all dot, 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 worker n. And you have you know this uh, total, and you th this is where the user kind of fits in. You have total, which is user plus the system memory, and then you have some heap headroom uh, that's that's up here. So basically, uh, what you'll do is based on your heap size, which we'll get into here in a second, um, you will you will want to set the total amount um, and uh, and the uh, the uh, sorry the max of the user amount and the max of the total amount. And so what the max is, is all of like what, if I run a query across all of these distributed workers, how much, what is the max limit of how, uh, of how much uh, memory one query can take for all of these users? So let's say this user is, is uh, like, they're all five gigs and I have five, uh, five um, uh, different uh, workers. workers. Yeah. So 
I have 25 gigs in total. So I don't want, let's say I, I expect that there's going to be at least two queries running at a given time. I want to have at least like, I don't want to be letting them go over 12 gigs, let's say. And that's, the, I, I know that because I'm only, I'm always going to have no more than two queries running at a time and they can take up to, you know, the, uh, uh, basically all, all of the, mem all the memory. So I don't want those two queries to overlap each other. So, and this isn't, this isn't exact science. In fact, you can go a little higher. Um, but, but in just generalizing of, uh, to give the concept, I don't want to let a query use more than 25 or then these two queries that I have running at any given time, I don't want that to go over 25 gigs. So I'm going to cap it at 12 and a half. Um, so that's the max. And then you also have to specify the maximum per node. So I would say, you know, in this five gig scenario, I could make that, you know, two, two and a half gigs or something like that. Uh, and then that would still say that these two queries that I expect uh, running on these nodes are not going to interfere. Now, that's also not exact because maybe not all of the queries are going to be running on all of the worker nodes at any given time. So there's a little bit of flex here and it's uh, really going to come down to that. It depends scenario of, you know, your, your, your use case, but um, in general, you're going to have to set a per node setting for user settings, and you're going to have to set a over the whole cluster node for those settings. And so that's, that's what this is. This query per node is saying, this is the max, you know, max amount of memory per, per node that any query can take for this particular node. And then um, this is going to be the max amount of memory over the entire cluster that, uh, that I want. Then similar, I'm going to skip system memory for a second. Similar, you have total memory. And you're going to set the same to a per node setting for the total memory and a not per node setting for, uh, for basically the cluster wide uh, setting for total memory. And what's and that's basically going to you know cover this bigger box that that encompasses user and system, and so there's nothing that actually explicitly sets system uh, the system memory. Um, the system memory is actually just set by whatever you set the total memory minus uh, the the user memory. So so basically you would take whatever set for uh, on the per node of of system you would say query max total memory per nodes uh, property minus the query max memory per node setting and then that gives you how much system memory there is per node and the same thing for the max system memory uh, that that can go that's just going to be the max total memory minus the max memory and that's how those those are basically computed um, system memory is just stuff you'll less be able to reason about it's more shared uh, basically shared memory that that's being used uh, across Presto. And it's not as, it's just less tracked. Um, it's basically, uh, you, I'm going to have play a, a thing from Dane where he kind of explains, it's just not worth tracking. It's, it's, it's these little things that take up a little bit of space, but it's more CPU than it's worth. Um, so, so you want to leave a little bit of system memory to, to have, uh, to have room for that. Then there's heap headroom. You don't want to take up, you basically don't want to take up every bit of the JVM heap as well. So you need to leave, you know, roughly 30% for this. And so when you set your JVM heap memory settings, um, you don't want to take up all of that, you know, like anytime you run a JVM, you don't want to take up all of the computer that you're running on's memory. So you're going to have to be mindful of that. And the same thing you're going to have to be careful about is this max total memory per node. You want to make sure that that plus the heap headroom that you've set um, is going to be less than what you set in the dash XMX settings for your for your Java JVM. So let's say Java JVM is four gigs. You want to make sure that your total memory for that node is like let's say three gigabytes plus one gigabyte, three gigabytes of user memory and one gigabyte of, of system memory. So with that, I think the best way to kind of uh, cover this, there's a one minute excerpt that I added into the show notes. Uh, and it's just going to be Dane talking about uh, a little bit of this, just to uh, kind of summarize this point of how he recommends that you come up with these numbers. Alas, if you have the heap and it's allocated all the way here. And then one of these structures comes along, some other proxy, something else, sorry, in here, like we allocate some extra thread stacks and there's no free space. The OS is gonna kill this entire process. And you don't have control over like what the GC is going to do for its data structure. So you have to have free space and you need to leave that there. Otherwise you make your system unstable. Uh, and it's worth buying a few extra machines to make sure your system is stable. So 
go to your machine in general, allocate 80% of what the machine actually has after virtualization, and allocate that to the heap. Then inside your Presto config, allocate 70% of the heap to Presto. Now, to the general data pool. Now, that is 70% of the heap for the track data structures that are directly accountable to a single query. It doesn't mean that Presto is wasting 30% of memory on its own internal junk. It just means those are the shared things that are used across all queries, and it's the shared stuff used across all the queries, and there's a bunch of stuff that we don't track because it takes more CPU to track it than it's worth. So in your mind, think 70% track, 30% untrack, as opposed to 70% used in 30%. So anyways, that's the gist. And uh, basically, you if you want to learn more about that, there's uh, Dane gets into the real nitty gritty of memory allocation. Um, I can actually link uh, to, to that whole, from the beginning of that part of the talk, uh, he, he go, goes into some real recommendations in general, his recommendation is to just buy more stuff. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, I mean, and, and he's not totally wrong, but at the same time, I, you know, it, it, we, we, we are empathetic to the fact that, you know, sometimes you're, you're limited on, on the amounts that you can dump into your Presto cluster, but that is usually a very easy solution, uh, that can be, that, that works. Um, and you usually want to have more memory than you're even expecting because in general when you start using presto it's very freeing and it, and it enables so much discovery of your data set so once people get a hold of it, it it blows up and that's typically the trend is that once you start you know on some initial assumption of how people are going to use presto it's just going to grow and so you have to be expecting that it's going to grow and you're going to have to scale as that as that grows um, or you're going to have to block people from using you know those those expectations and so it's a difficult thing and it's it's always it depends but uh you know we're always available on slack to help you out if you if you are struggling with this uh it's you know i'm not we're not covering this to say you know if you are st struggling with this this is the answer and you know don't b bother us anymore we we want to hear your scenarios because uh there are always uh everybody's cases are are always very specific to what their uh, environment's like, uh, even down to the you know politics in their office of how they actually set things up and are able to get new resources. So it, it's it's constraining and it's frustrating sometimes, but you know we are here to help uh, and try to get you past uh, uh, all of these kind of initial bugs of like oh, or not bugs, but like kind of difficulties uh, and issues to uh, to get the correct uh, you know size of your Presto cluster and get it running so that you're successful in what you know using using Presto. Yeah. Also, I wanted to mention. Um, there is no waste happening as such, right? Like if you get a big machine that has a lot of memory, um, it's not like it's going to just waste that memory and sit there idling. Like you're going to have like the memory basically just captures the amount an individual query can have um, that has a lot of data. But if you have like a thousand users that fire lots of small queries, they will still run in that memory pool just in parallel, right? So that's not a problem of like, oh, well, it's still going to do one at a time. It's just going to do them all in parallel. Like Presto runs on one JVM that, with that one memory set, but it uses tons of threads internally for parallelizing all these different uh, users and processing of their separate queries, basically. So it's not like you're going to waste anything if you buy a bigger machine. Uh, on the contrary, it's going to be more efficient. The only, uh, the one of the reasons also why you want to potentially have a bigger machine is because that can prevent your query from running altogether. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that in the failed queries in the web UI, if there is just not enough memory to hold certain structures in place to say do some aggregation or some processing, then the query will fail. And then in some cases, the only way to make them not fail is to get more memory. So having fewer nodes with more memory is in that sense more efficient than having a whole bunch of small ones. Yeah. Because and, then you get those problems. And Dane, so in that in that training series, this is the training series where Dane talks about you know tuning your, your queries and we have that linked in the show notes as well. Um, 
just check that out. Like if you're if you're interested in this topic of of you know sizing your cluster, he has some really useful gems there, and so uh, I definitely recommend uh, taking a look at that. And and you uh, you emceed that one, <laughs> so all those actually. Yeah, I'll have with preparing the slides and everything. And there's also again there's another chapter about that in the book as well. It's not yep. as smart as what Dane has put into. <laughs> yep. Into the it's because he training, can talk about together, it. it's all like it's because he can complex. talk about it just like off the cuff and, and it doesn't have to be as formal as a book does and it's like he just he just tell, tells it how it is and and it's yeah. much much more digestible from a okay what do i actually do you know yeah. <laughs> so cool well uh if there's nothing more do we have any questions before we hop off I no it's been any? good Cool. I think. Well, uh, if you want to learn more about Presto Yourself, do check out the uh, O'Reilly Definitive Guide. We'll have that linked in the show notes. Uh, music for the show is uh, from the Mega Man 6 gameplay album by Christ Christoph uh, Slavikowski. And uh, as always, for Fast Data at Resto, Presto is the besto.